Yes. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you, man. It's been a while. No, it's been a while. So I was just saying before you got on that we're so excited to have you. Um, I have been always um, just in absolute awe um, of your work, um, your authorship uh, in particular. Um, and I just think it's such an exciting space to really um, begin to understand how neuroscience, you know, really impacts and shapes the way we make decisions. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my experience with it, but today is not about me. Today is about the Mentorship Monday community and getting live mentorship and live mentorship moments from the Timothy Maurice Webster. And Timothy, the way that it works um, is that um, the community sends you questions for you. So here are my two pages um, of questions <laughs> that I have for you. Let's and get, so I try to get the best. Uh, no, I really hope we're going to get through them without me hijacking you uh, to ask my own questions. So I'm going to try to do that. But thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Why, why are you interested in neuroscience? You said you have your own sort of relationship with it. I'm actually super curious. Oh, yeah. So the first time I actually came across um, a behavioral scientist in particular was probably in 2016 in Rwanda and his name is Dr. Alda Shifa. He was uh, at the time uh, teaching at Harvard and now he's at uh, Princeton and he was talking about um, cognitive bandwidth and how it's eroded um, or there's a direct correlation between cognitive bandwidth and um, or at least a reverse correlation with poverty. And so basically this entire idea that the more poor you are, the more decisions you're going to have to make in a day. And that is why we have scenarios uh, that such as, you know, um, people who come from poor communities um, underperforming in the workplace. And that's just simply because they have, um, you know, they've just, they've just had to make so many more decisions before they even got to their desk that their decision-making quality is a little bit reduced. And I found that fascinating, so much so that I followed Elder's work around the world. I went to visit him in Princeton last year. Um, no, and, he's, no. and, he's, yeah, and he's founded something called Ideas 42, okay. which I think is actually phenomenal. So Timothy, I have a little bit of a crisis that's just happened. Somebody's at my door and I need to send someone, Percy, let me get, can you please ask your mom to go open the door for me? Somebody's delivering a package. Guys, my life is a bit of a mess. <laughs> okay, cool. That is so funny. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's so funny because, um, you know, people are starting to become much more aware that the environment influences your capacity. People are becoming much more aware that your relationships influence your capacity. I'm very interested in neurobiology, as you know, my background, you know, I was always been interested in the psychology of personal branding. And then I felt like I wasn't going deep enough. And then in 2015, I went back to school to study neuroscience and I just became obsessed with the brain and how, if we're talking about gender, what are the brain implications? If we're talking about women's empowerment, what are the brain implications? If you are hurt and you are, you feel like you've been done wrong in a relationship why does it hurt you in the stomach you know if somebody cheats on you what's happening in the brain and what happens you know i became interested in the brain implications to everything you know and from how trauma influences you and how that impacts you know your leadership quality as you say cognitive bandwidth you know why is it that people who don't have nature around them one of the things i'm most distressed about right now is how, you know, and you look in a lot of communities, they've stripped, they, there's no parks. So you can't, you know, if you spend three straight days in nature, knows that you realize that your cancer fighting cells grow by up to 50%, just three straight days in nature. Wow. And so your ability to study as a child can be influenced your memory can be influenced by nature. So I became interested in all of this stuff. And so I went back to school and spent two years at MIT in Boston, and it radically changed my life to a point where, you know, I, I don't think everything can be solved through the brain. I think some things we're still trying to discover, but I have been able to explore 
you know, and shed light. I try to bring the brightest neuroscientists, brightest scientists on my podcast, which I've had for nine years now. And um, if people listen, I mean, one of my favorite episodes recently was how words can change what a child, a child's desire to want to clean up, for example. I interviewed sure. Jonah, I interviewed Jonah Berger of um, Wharton School in Pennsylvania. And he says that if you ask a child, will you help clean up versus will you be a helper and clean up? Wow. So Just an identity shift yeah, in the wording. Yes, in the brain. And immediately you trigger a several parts of the brain. But ultimately, the idea of you being part of a community is triggered. And you, we are wired to be part of a community. No one wants to be seen as an outsider, right? Wow. It's like if you want more people to wash their hands, you know, if you own a restaurant, you want more people to wash their hands, you can put a sign up that says 80% of people, 80% of um, our, you know, employees wash their hands. No one wants to be part of the 20%. <laughs> So these are neural basic principles. So this is why I'm interested. I just wanted to share that while we were, you know, having a chat, okay? I think, I think that's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I really think that's incredible how community, um, you know, changes the way people behave. And I'm looking at the, the, the quality of the questions that have come here, uh, come through here, Timothy, and I can tell you that people are really interested in the work that you do, and they're really interested in understanding how their brains work and how their brains impact or influence the way they make decisions. Sure. So I'm going to try my best to power through these, but please okay. don't feel compelled to rush through them. Um, some of them we might find that we've, we've tackled already, but let's start right at the beginning. I really like, um, I'm gonna start with Didi's question. So Didi is asking, sis, you, you've written a book called Soul to Soul, Authentic Branding. And, and Didi says, that sounds really fascinating. Can you just talk a little bit about how the brain, how, how, how the brain works can help us with our personal brand and also getting that personal brand to align with our core values? So what's the link in essence, Timothy, between sure. my brain and my brand? All right. So the simple, the simple, the reason I wrote that book is I was interested in authenticity. I have been fascinated with what is authenticity here's a here's a specific example of how we often show up inauthentic without realizing it so let's say you have an instagram page and you feeling good today you've got your makeup done you're looking good you wearing a power suit or you're at the beach you've got two voices trying to influence what you do so you've got your higher cognitive voice, which is, I am, that is your logic side of the brain. So I am at the beach. I am, um, I've been exercising. I feel good about myself. I want to post something to motivate people. So that's your higher cognitive part of the brain. Then you have your lower feel good, emotional, limbic, part of the brain that is responsible for the sensory input. And you're like, I'm feeling myself today. And I think I'm looking hot and I want to attract a partner. And so you've got these two distinct voices that are often at odds with each other. And you see it play out on people's Instagram pages, for example, they go, they will post a photo with their booty popping and they'll say, the Bible says, Says that you can be saved. <laughs> and so you can that, that's, see. That's, yeah. That's you can clearly see that. Just, that's schizophrenic, just imagining that. Yeah. yeah but you, you see it all the time. People, you know, people, that, there's a great photo of them looking incredible. And you can see all they really, if they reconcile these two voices and they, and they, they have that conversation with themselves, the dominant reason they're doing it it's just to show you that I'm feeling myself. But because we're taught cognitively and consciously, it's better to put something that doesn't say I'm being arrogant. Because remember, one thing that Africa and Asia has in common is that I am because you are. So we need to be working together. You know, our identities are woven together. So I don't want to lift myself up above you. 
I want us to be together. So I don't want, if you're feeling bad, I don't want you to feel worse. So instead of you saying, look how hot I am, you say, read the Bible, you'll feel better about your life, etc. So this is how these, this is why often we come across as inauthentic, is that we have these two voices driving our behavior. And most of us have never interrogated that internal war between these two voices. Why are we really doing whatever we're doing? What is the dominant voice that's yeah. driving us? And so that is ultimately why I wrote that book, Soul to Soul. Your internal soul and the soul of your feet are often at odds. And this is what's interesting. Here's an example. Every, every so often you see somebody with a brand new pair of shoes and they will post their shoes. They'll be walking. One of my favorites. So first of all, I know a lot of these influential people, so I'm going to call a lot of them out today. One of my favorites is Amanda DuPont. I love Amanda. Amanda is like mad mastered this thing of like taking these two conversations where she is she is posting a beautiful image of something while simultaneously advertising her aesthetics or her shoes or her clothing or whatever. And then if you were to sit down and you would ask Amanda, which one of these are more important to you in this moment? Which one is which one is the dominant driver? That shifts. And I would ask anybody watching this to sit down down with yourself and ask yourself out of which two of these voices am I speaking the loudest at any given time at any given time what am I really trying to say in this moment what am I really trying to communicate am I speaking from my lower primitive self where I'm just feeling myself and I want to feel better and I want to be the hottest person on Instagram or am I genuinely trying to be higher conscious and inspire and motivate people. Which voice is the loudest in me? Because when you know which one, you become more authentic, you become more intentional, and you speak with more authority and more power. If the dominant messaging is not coming through, then you are not being authentic. And that's why I wrote that book, Soul mm. to Soul. So when you position your brand, people want authentic people. People, we're in this area with all the filters and all the, you know, all the ability to manipulate. People are now seeking authenticity. And that's why I wrote the book, Soul to Soul. I absolutely love that. So, of course, I'm now thinking about my own social media pages and what they look like. And I, I'm let's absolute go. culprit. I want to go look. Um, let's look at them while um, you're talking. I'm going to see if you're full of shit, too. If, <laughs> if you're full of shit, I'm going to call you out, Dorothy. <laughs> so, do have a look. But I'm calling myself out because... I can totally see myself posting a picture where I think I'm looking really pretty and a Bible verse, you know, um, God, where, where, you know, where, where God says, I have, you know, I've known you um, even before you were born or whatever the case is. Yes. And as you're speaking now, I'm like, yeah, I can see how there are moments where the duplicity actually comes yes. through because we're all trying to cower just a little bit so that it doesn't seem as if you're actually saying, look how, how great my skin looks. <laughs> so this is, so if, let me read what you posted here, okay? Here you posted some really deep stuff. Yo, I think, in my opinion, from this post, you were just saying, look how nice my hair is. But that's not what you said. What you did said, I say? You, you cannot observe people through an ideology. Your ideology observed for you, yo. Talk about deep. <laughs> and so, and so, th so that would be a classic example of, of trying to, you know, trying to be all insightful and intelligent and so on. But at the same time, I actually remember what I was, was happening on that day. One, I fit into my new, je my old jeans as a mom, and I had my makeup done, and I had nice hair. So I was feeling myself on that day. And it was why didn't you say so? Why didn't you say this? Why why didn't you say, guys? I'm fitting into my new jeans, and my hair came together, guys, and I'm feeling really good. And then drop your ideology stuff. But that's the lesson, right? So I love that because that's a great call out. Um, and you know, as you were talking, I was just like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm such a culprit of all of this. But I think it's such a fantastic reflective note for all of us. But by the way, just on a sidebar, I hope that you, you do consult uh, for this because I'm going to need you come and give me some brand uh, insight a little bit. We need to fix some stuff and so, get some alignment going. How, how long 
long have you had your Instagram page? Um, I think I've had it now. Oh, I don't know, maybe four years, three years. And I've had different people. So I started off managing it myself. Then I just couldn't keep up. Then I had somebody else. And now I've had one person for over a year. But I, I do sometimes feel that, you, especially when you have somebody else managing your page, that you, they, there is sometimes a little bit of a disconnect between your voice and how they think your voice sounds, even if you try to correct it along the way. Um, and it's a really hard thing. So what do you tell your clients who don't have the capacity to manage their own pages, but still want to be out there and come across as authentic as possible? So I would say, for example, to you, you are an absolute powerhouse. If, if your page aligned with your power and your values, you should at least have three or 400,000 followers based on your reach. So for example, with your personal brand capacity and the fact that powerful business, so young and up and coming business people and existing powerhouse uh, professionals are, should be following you loyally because you have such a broad perspective. You could be bringing people and channeling the various voices of the people you interview, you engage. You're going to BRICS. So if you did like a brick series of like snapshots of some of the conversations that you're allowed to share and some of the challenges and you did a series, what it's like going into BRICS and holding space and conversations with some of the most powerful people and the research that it required to do this kind of along the way so that you're not creating content that is inauthentic, et cetera. And so those are the ways that you could captivate your audience without spending a lot of extra time. And, and it's interesting because it's funny because, you know, we, you and I just started following each other recently, even though we've known each other forever. And the first thing I saw when I saw your page was just massive opportunity for you to galvanize all these extraordinary professionals that know who you are, et cetera. And I, it'd be interesting to see if you employed that strategy, if you were to get, you know, your three or 400,000 people that should be following you, you know? Three or 400,000 sounds a whole lot better than 26,000, so we're on it. And of course, Ndumiso, who, who manages my page, is on. So I hope you're taking notes, Ndu. So let me get to the next question. So Didi, thank you for a great question, because I think it's allowed us to have a really fantastic conversation. So Kitsi sent us a question, and Kitsi says, um, Timothy, how do you open up um, mind blocks? So let's assume you, are, you know, a lot of us would call it writer's block, or I'm just not creative today, or I'm just feeling stuck in the brain. Um, what is that in the first instance when you're feeling stuck, when you can't write, or you can't, you, the juices aren't flowing, things aren't just coming together? And how do you then overcome that when you find yourself in that space? So I'm going to answer the question by giving a little bit of research and then offering some practical tools. Okay. So do you have a pet? Do you have a dog? Yes, do I do. Anything? I have a little dog. His name is Kusi. So Kusi, what is the fundamental difference between Kusi's brain and your brain? If we take Kusi's brain out and we were to put it into the camera now, and then we take your brain out, you'll see that the shapes are very similar. The only difference between yours and my brain and your dog's brain is the primary part is the number one the size and capacity but the it doesn't really have an evolved prefrontal cortex so everybody on this call right now are probably strategic people who have a lot of stuff going on they have a lot of tax on the brain there's a lot they're trying to keep up with threads and TikTok and work and family and all kinds of stuff right so there's the part of the brain that's taxed heavily when you're trying to do all of this and plan and think through your next holiday and try to find food for and pay black tax and all of this stuff. The front part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex is called the CEO of the brain. That part of the brain is highly taxed. Now, couscous, your, your, <laughs> your dog is not sitting around trying to figure out anything about dog tax, not trying to sit around, figure out what's it going to do for a December holiday. Your dog is just chilling. And when it sees you, the emotive region of the brain goes buck wild when you walk in, right? And so that's why the emotive dynamic of a dog and humans connect at a very high level. They have high level sensory input. They have a lot of cells to be able to smell. That's why dogs can often detect cancer 
and there's uh, stories about dogs that have helped smell dis-ease because wow. dis-ease has smell to it and so dogs can pick up covid and all kinds of stuff so dogs have highly evolved brains but they don't have the part of the brain called a highly evolved part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex now that's important because often when we get stuck and we can't break out of a rut or we have writer's block or we feel blocked this part of the brain is overly taxed and we struggle so the recommendation from neuroscientists so I, all i do my work is help you apply behavioral science and neuroscience to personal branding to leadership etc i'm not a neuroscientist i just research and i spend time interviewing them and trying to share it back to people now well here's what's important there is a there's a concept called, called shutting off your prefrontal shut down your prefrontal so everybody here who's experiencing blocks creative challenges i want you to shut down your prefrontal here's how you do that if you're playing with your child or you going in the park uh nosy with your dog and you're just running around you're not thinking about anything you're shutting down that prefrontal if you go for a spa treatment you're mm -hmm. shutting down the prefrontal if you go plant a garden or you are you know, working in your garden, you're shutting down the prefrontal. If you've got a small child, get out a puzzle and games, you are shutting down the prefrontal. Einstein said the highest form of research is playing. So here's what's happening when you shut down the prefrontal. When you shut down the prefrontal, you unleash the unconscious mind's creative power. When you shut down the prefrontal, you, you enable or equip all of the genius and all the pattern making ability in your unconscious mind to release and that's why when you stop thinking about something the answer often comes and all of us can all of us can you know it can remember a time when that happened you've been working all day trying to figure out and solve something but you, the answer never came until you stopped thinking and I believe, I'm, I'm not very religious, but I'm very spiritual. And if you study Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, all of them, even the Bible says, be still and know that I am. Why, why does he say that? Because if you still and you shut down that prefrontal, you allow the spiritual dimension, the pattern making genius in the unconscious mind to start putting patterns together and allowing for the spiritual majestic forces to come together and give you answers for what you're dealing with so you're unblocking by shutting down and so we've been taught that fight work all day work three in the morning try everything by all means to just find the answers and think 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 but you've got a schedule into your life shutting down it's not a luxury so let's say you've got two or three kids you've got a busy home whatever you've got to put it into your schedule You've got to say to your husband, your partner, whoever else that's supporting you in your community, next Thursday, eight days from now, I need to shut down. So what do we need to do to make sure this is possible? You cannot hope that it happens. You've got to schedule it into your life to shut down. And the moment you start doing that, you'll start seeing revelations and ideas and the unblockage just start to happen. Yo, I, um, I, I literally have goosebumps as I'm listening to you because I think the way I used to understand it for me was always realizing that when I go to sleep as I'm sort of I'm mulling with a problem or a challenge, when I wake up, I always seem to have a whole lot more clarity. Yeah. And it just makes so much sense based on what you've said because I've shut down in that moment and I'm taking that, um, I'm taking that instruction very seriously i'm scheduling shutdown time so my team is on they they can probably will hold me to this but i'm not very good at rhythms of rest and so i i, I mean i think the way you've articulated it today is absolutely incredible the other thing that you said that i just think resonates so much is that the highest form of research is play i mean mm. i have i have never heard that um yeah. and it just you know, it just makes so much sense. Um, there are a couple of comments here. Van Fierce is saying, even scripturally, the answer is always rest. We are encouraged to enter rest. 
I absolutely love that. And Timothy, unfortunately, I've got so many questions for you. I'm not going to keep talking a little bit, uh, talking about what's resonating with me. Let me get to another one. Um, so there's a question from Kia. And Kia wants to know, what is the best way um, uh, to, in fact, let me, I'm going to read it as is, and then I'll rephrase it a little bit. So she said, what is the best way to tap out of your feelings when making crucial decisions under pressure? And I think Kia's assumption that is baked into that question is that if you are emotional or, in, or emotions are bad, for making crucial decisions. And I maybe want you to, to maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Are emotions necessarily always bad when we have to make big decisions? And if they are, what's the mechanism then to, you know, to differentiate, create distance? And if they're not, how do we use our emotions to make better decisions? So emotions are beautiful. They are powerful. They are what enables us it's the fuel of the brain. You know, some people are slightly more on the scale in the continuum in their emotional capacity and some are slightly less, but every human has emotion. And I think part of, part of what science is now showing us is that you've got a design to control and channel emotion. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to lose weight. The question becomes, what is the emotion that you, you are attaching to the thing you're currently doing that keeps you from losing weight? Now, let's say you're spending time on the couch and you are watching the, all the latest series on Netflix and you're not going to gym. What we often underestimate is the beauty of the couch, the beauty of the series and watching nosy stories instead of going to gym, we underestimate the, the emotional glue that's bonding us to the couch. This is called the immunity to change. The immunity to change is a concept that was pioneered by two authors called Keegan and Leahy from Harvard. Often there are things competing with the very thing you wanna change. So if you, for example, say, um, I'll give you a fun example. I, in early lockdown, I discovered that my chest was looking like an old man. Now, I am older, but I shouldn't have had a chest like I was looking, right? It, it was bad. And so the thing that I wanted to do was change my chest. But the thing that I needed to do, which was do push-ups, and I hate doing. And so there's a concept called temptation bundling that helps me manage my emotion. And this is some powerful, powerful work by a researcher at, she's also at Wharton in Pennsylvania, a Katie Milkman, Katie Milkman. She also has a great podcast called Choiceology. And so the idea is simple, is that you take the emotion, the negative emotion, put it with a positive emotion. So here's how it worked for me. I wanted to change my chest, but I hated doing push-ups. So how do I override the emotion, the negative emotion, I bundle it with a positive emotion. So you have to design the effect and here's how it worked. So I said to myself, the one thing I really love doing is jogging. So I said, if I want to, if, if, if I want to go jogging, then I have to do five push-ups. So five push-ups became the ticket to go jogging. And so because I bundled them together, the negative emotion with the positive emotion, the positive emotion helped override the negative one. And this is called temptation bundling pioneered by Katie Milkman. Now, this is an important concept in a, a many areas of your life. You can apply it to kids, you can apply it to yourself, etc. Look at what the negative emotions, see if you can bundle it with something positive and create this relationship between the two and see if you can override it. So after a couple of weeks, I was up to 10. After a few months, I was up to 50. Now I can do easily, you know, I don't wanna, you know, go on and on, but you get the point. And so I transformed my chest by falling in love with the very thing that I absolutely hated. And so everybody's situation is different, which is why I like to share frameworks. So the temptation bundling framework can often really solve 
for grappling with negative emotion. So that's one tool. <clears throat> Another tool is what I call second brain design. This is a concept that I've really worked hard on. And second brain design is, let's say I want to drink more water, but I've got negative emotions when it comes to drinking water. So what I do is I will put water bottles throughout my house. So when I wake up, my body is creating a relationship with what I see because we think in formulas, me plus this water equals something. And so, <laughs> listen, she's not going to tell that. me how much you can actually press. <clears throat> listen, Van, I don't want to intimidate you because I know that um, not everybody's there yet. <laughs> I love it. So anyway, so um, Google uses this at their offices in New York. One of the things that you can do is let's say for example you want to you want to eat more healthy or you want to go on a healthy journey what they do with their offices in new york knows is that they will they put the unhealthy drinks high or low because your brain because of what we talked about when we first opened only has so much cognitive capacity so the brain will try to preserve energy by choosing what's at eye level so i want everybody to try this go and try to rearrange go rearrange your uh, your home cupboards put the healthiest stuff more at eye level yes there will, will be long days and there will be challenging days and there will be days where you reach up really high or you go down really low but on average you will choose what's at eye level and so what you're doing is you're overriding the instinct to do something negative or to follow your negative emotions by designing for what you want. And so this is the reason why, um, you know, when pe people use, let's say when people use uh, vision boards, your instinct is to spend money somewhere else, but the vision board is a unconscious reminder of what you really want. And that's why vision boards work. It's a second brain design principle. And so those are two tools you can use to manage your emotions second brain design and temptation bundling i will say that shutting down the noise will be the third tool so one of the reasons why every great spiritual giant from jesus to everybody else would go to a mountain and leave their disciples is because the emotions produce mystery one of my favorite poets is ben okri He's a giant poet, and I want to read you something that he said about something that he said about sometimes words get in the way of emotion. So let me break this down real quick. So it's a long poem. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a snapshot. He says, we began before words and we will end beyond them. He ends this poem and says, I think we need more, more of the wordlessness in our lives. We need more stillness, more of a sense of, of wonder, a feeling for the mystery of life. We need, we need more love, more silence, more deep listening, more deep giving. And I'll say to anybody who feels extraordinarily emotional that shutting down your Instagram and scheduling it, shutting down TikTok and scheduling it, because what you're doing is you are creating so much noise that you can't hear what's happening on the inside. That when I go for a run in the morning, when I play tennis, when I play basketball, I'm not just doing it for the competitive part. I'm doing it specifically because in those moments, I have no noise. And so, <clears throat> You have to understand that some of the emotions come from genetic instincts. It comes from intergenerational trauma. So they don't always have a label. And it takes time to get to know your emotions, get to, to get to know where they come from. And that's why spirituality and calmness and stillness is so important, is that you can't always pinpoint where emotions come from. And so you've got to design to control them. You've got to reduce the noise. And you've got to often bundle negative with positive emotion to be able to get the effect that you want. So for the recap, so um, the brain design principles you've given us, temptation bundling, um, the, the second brain design, and shutting down the noise. 
I mean, yes. I think that's, you know, that's absolutely excellent. I mean, when you talk about temptation bonding, and especially in the context of losing weight, I'm like, I see why the weight loss is not coming off because my positive emotion is eating. Yeah. So it doesn't help mm. if I go, oh, I'm going to eat whatever I want just because I'm going to then box it off later. In fact, yeah. the, the, the impact of that is standing stock still. So I've got to figure out what's a different positive emotion that is not eating that, that I need to actually bundle to allow me to go and train like I'm supposed to. And then when you talk about second brain design, it's so interesting. So in my house, the wine um, and the alcohol in general is, is at the topmost shelf. I'm the shortest wow. person in the house outside wow. of my newborn son. I still look for the ladder and I get up when I really want um, a glass of wine. And when I think about it, even our junk food cupboard is in the scullery tucked away in a cupboard that's also quite high for me to reach. And yet I will find my way around to go and do that. So but you don't, be interesting. But, but I bet you, I'll bet you, Nelsie, that if you were to shift the wine and put it at eye level, I'd have and if you were to get the unhealthy and get the unhealthy stuff and make it easier, you would drink more wine and you would eat more unhealthy. Yeah. So yes, we will go there sometimes when things are tough. I'm not saying to anyone that the design principle is going to stop you from doing it, but it will cause you to do it less and less. I even and make that, better decisions. Exactly, over time. So you continue to tweak the designs. For me, that's what's really helped me is going, okay, uh, all right, here's what I need to do. I need to put one of my design principles, I put notifications in my phone so that I don't have to think. Because one of the things about Motivation is very overrated, Nosy. What we should be doing is designing for what we want. And so if, let's say, for example, if I need to be motivated tomorrow to get up and do certain things, I'd rather be using that energy on something else. Instead, what I do is I put reminders in my phone to do it so I don't have to hold it in my mind. Are you following yeah. me? Motivation is entirely overrated. You should be designing for what you want versus trying to hold in your mind what you want so sure. if you design it and you put your vision board and you put all these things up it's so much easier love that so let's go to tato's question we've got about 20 minutes left um tato says when it comes to decision making timothy we often hear about trusting your gut how can neuroscience <laughs> help us to distinguish between intuitive insights and impulsive decisions so when you're trusting your gut which is it like how do you know that this is just this is just me acting on impulse because that's what i feel like doing or this is my intuition at play and it's guiding me to make a good decision so i want to separate women from men on this because women have more sensory nodes more capacity to for smell for hearing to be able to protect your offspring this is this is really powerful what i'm about to share did you know that, Nosy, let's say you and I kissed. Do you know that you have more power to detect the strength of my DNA than I have of yours? Why? Because you've been wired to be able to smell if there's disease in me. You've wow. been wired to be able to detect in a first kiss whether or not I could help you pass on stronger genes through our bloodline. And so if you, for example, as a woman, smell something that seems a bit off, then you should trust that. Because ultimately, you've been neurobiologically wired to pick up on nonsense. But what happens is you ignore it because society says, maybe this person is ideal. Maybe this person is a, it could, we would look good together on Instagram. Ooh, this person has money. Meanwhile, your whole body is telling you, stay away from this person. And so that, that is very instinctively wired. Now, let's say, for example, you in a board meeting and the numbers are not really adding up and you start to feel a bit off about what's happening. You want to measure that against data and analytics and not just try to you know, rely on the gut because the gut can be off it can be triggered by bias it can be triggered by the person who is presenting you in fact you don't like them and there's something off about them but meanwhile the data is right 
So if it's something personal that has to do with how you engaging someone one on one, and that person is you spending time with that person and things are a bit off, the, the energy, the smell is off, then trust that. I mean, one of my favorite studies is women were asked to smell 10 t shirts where men had worn um, a shirt without fragrance or cologne. And for the most part, they were able to detect whether or not that person used to have a disease and was healed, still had a disease, never had a disease. And they chose, the idea was a dating study. They would smell the shirt one by one and then ultimately choose which smell aligned with them for a first date. Wow. In, in the study, the people who chose based on smell versus eyesight, the relationship had a better chance of survival. So what I would suggest you guys do if you're single, all my single people, the next time you wish someone you really like, <laughs> get quiet, hold them. If they ask you why you're hugging them for a little bit longer, just say, look, you know, I want to be in your presence or whatever, but just get a good smell. <laughs> you because, know what? Yeah. I am shocked at that because I used to always joke to one of my really good friends who's actually on the call here and I used to say in my previous relationships every time I knew that the relationship was about to end the person would start, start smelling funny for yes. me like I'd pick up yes. um, body odor or I'd kind of like go oh I don't like the way their mouth smells or you know and it was always the weirdest thing and we used to always laugh at it to say as soon as Nazi starts complaining about how a guy smells, you 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 it's know that it's over. And it's, it's over. so interesting because yeah. it's like I override the smell element yes. because I want to be in the relationship. Yeah. And then when yeah. everything else is sort of fizzled, I can really smell the person. And I'm like, I don't like how this smells. And I mean, I remember breaking up with somebody because I just, I didn't like the way he smelled. That yeah. is insane. Interesting. So that's why we, you know, the question was simply, should you trust your gut and when should you not trust your gut? In those instances where it's very personal and you can feel that the neurochemistry is not connecting, you really need to trust that because part of the reason why you've been wired with this additional capacity is because, let's say for example, your partner's cheating on you. That person's chemistry that person your partner is cheating with chemistry is getting inside of you as well and it alters the smell of that person and so you, you can detect these things when so part of the reason why women often go people women are just tired of being gaslit because sometimes you don't always have the answer your gut is telling you nigga stop lying to me i know i know i sense it Ladies, now you have a reason to go back to this dude or who, your partner, if it's a woman, whoever, and say, I have, this, I have discovered that my neurochemistry is wired to pick up your bullshit. <laughs> I love it. It is, it has to be our new lion, guys. My neurochemistry is wired to pick up your bullshit. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Kustans uh, lit. Things are going to be lit uh, in the relationship streets, I must say. Okay, so I love this question by Paul. Paul calls himself the king of youth. Paul says, um, Timothy, tell us a little bit. Um, he says, Timothy, tell us a little bit about cognitive biases and how they impact our choices. And is there a technique that we can use to mitigate their influence, uh, the, the influence of cognitive bias? Maybe let's give you the floor on that one, Timothy. So um, I can tell you, like, you know what I love about you? If anybody has not seen you work, you're really good at it. Like, you're so good, it's scary. You're like, we're on Instagram Live, and you're like, let me just give you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm so sorry. I'm, I went into work, work mode, you're right. <laughs> but you're really good at this thing. So let me just say that biases are really good. You know, I just saw a friend of mine, uh, Fezile, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, World or whatever. I think he's international. He's, he's been on the moon. He's internet, whatever. Mr. Intergalactic is a really cool dude, but dope human being. He's very muscular and he's very built. And when we play basketball, I have a bias that if I never saw him before, I'd want him on my team. 
That's very <laughs> intelligence, a smart bias to have. If I'm looking for someone who's going to be a strong defender, can anchor our team, I would choose him over somebody who's a bit more slender. Now, I could be wrong, and maybe he's not good. Fortunately, Fazile is really, really good. So my bias would be right. So most biases are actually good, and they help us become efficient. Let's say, for example, I met you for the first time, and I hear the way you speak, but I've never seen you present before. And I go, my gut, my biases for your level of articulation suggest I want you at my next event. Before I even check on online to see how good you are. More than likely, my patterns of unconscious bias are going to be right. And for the most part, they are. When people say, for example, I wrote a piece in Daily Maverick a few years back about why we judge books by the cover. I don't know if you know this, but some of the top international female authors don't use their first name mm. because women and men have a bias for male authors. So what happens is, for example, J.K. Rowling, female author, E.L. Gray, who wrote Fifty Shades of Grey, they don't use their first name because we have these unconscious biases. Now, I'm not saying any of the, my whole point is this. In the cases of why we judge books by their cover quickly, because life is happening very fast. If I'm walking through the mall and somebody approaches me for their, to, to give me their number. I had this happen the other night. I was telling a good friend of mine, Kanye, about this. This woman walked up to me um, after I left um, Nelson Mandela Square having a meal, and she grabbed me by the arm. And she's like, hi, how are you? You don't look like you're from here. Immediately, there was this awkward unconscious bias based on how she was dressed the whole night, that she's probably not good. Turns out that she was just a well-dressed prostitute mm. that's in town to be able to make sure she leverages these BRICS people. You know, <laughs> These business. It's called business. Yeah, it's business. <laughs> and so, most of our biases are good. Now, let's talk about what happens and how to manage and navigate the world of unconscious bias. One of the ways is if you want a workplace and design a workplace where you help remove a lot of the negative unconscious bias, then you re you you have hiring practices where you don't put people's first names, for example, or you don't put their names at all. That's one of the ways to navigate bias. You just receive the CV without a name. And then you ask everybody to come in that you actually like based on the CV, not the name. Because oftentimes, we are drawn to familiarity. If somebody speaks a similar language, your brain relaxes a bit more. One of the reasons why bias is interesting is that if somebody, um, Let's say, for example, you're around somebody who's you wearing a cross and they're wearing a cross. Then you feel a little bit more comfortable with them. You feel a bit more at ease. Anytime there's an in-group, out-group dynamic, let's say right now we have an in-group, out-group dynamic. What you want to do when you're trying to navigate bias is this. You want to try to find something that's in common to create an in-group dynamic. So you're South African, I'm American. So what I need to do if I want to connect with you is quickly to find something we have in common and try to rally our conversation around commonality to be able to override your bias for not liking Americans. Are you following me? This is very, very important. So if I'm in Cape Town and I'm working with a lot of white people, for example, immediately I start looking for what we have in common. If they run, I highlight the running, the fact that I also run. Because what I'm doing is I'm creating an at ease effect in the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain. If there are negative biases, this part of the brain is firing at a high level. So what we try to do when I ask people to, if you're working with in-group, out-group, you're working with difficult people who don't like you because maybe they've got a bias against you, try to solve that, to diffuse that bias by finding in-group dynamics, things you have in common. And if you have nothing in common, you're two human beings that are struggling at the robot together. If you have nothing in common you can find you probably are a child to somebody somewhere find there's always something and if you only highlight the differences you're going to continue to trigger the negative biases and you're going to find yourself in a situation where you don't get along with these people so let me let me ask something because i think you um you've just highlighted something that i think is so important in the way we think about race relations in south africa so for example one of the experiences i always talk about is you know, the, the, the act um, of um, black professionals having to assimilate 
in white corporate environments. And oftentimes you, you'll hear black South Africans say, you know, I don't want to carry the burden of having to teach people or I don't want to. And for me, it sounds like it's the burden of bias. Who carries the burden of having to make the positive, the positive bias? Because it Ooh. feels like you're constantly having to Yo. look, hey, let's forget that hey. I'm black. Let's I got connect you. to this, the fact that we power. both run. Yo, this is power. So I've had these features. Some, of, some people watching may know that I've had these features on radio for many years. I've partnered with Fat Joe. I've partnered with DJ Fresh to share some of these ideas on popular radio. And one of the reasons why I did that is not because I'm interested in being famous. I'm interested in tackling these type of subjects. And one time we had a call. I think it was on Fat Joe. It was myself, Fat Joe, and Pro on, on a Saturday. I got a call from a guy who says, I've got dreadlocks. And I'm struggling to get a job in a predominantly white bank. And so, so he says that he went to the interview and it was like, you know, we're a bit conservative here. Maybe if you didn't have dreadlocks, maybe. So he goes, thinks about his life. He cuts his dreadlocks and he goes back and they say, and, and they say, I'm sorry, we've already hired somebody cut his dreadlocks, got rid of his dreadlocks, and they were already He went to another organization, and they said, we really like you and everything. Maybe if you were a bit more interesting, maybe if you had dreadlocks. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. You know how radio is. That's what I love about radio. People call in and tell you raw stories. So I asked this guy, I said, were the dreadlocks spiritual to you? Did they matter deeply to you, or was it just an aesthetic? Was it just for you to be the man, to try to be that guy, that cool dude, that chakra dude, you know, whatever you call the opposite of a chakra, hun? Are you that guy? He said, no, the dreadlocks didn't really matter. I need to feed my family. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, okay, well, then cutting your dreadlocks is fine. So you've got to decide if something is deeply spiritual and is part of your culture, figure out a way to weave it in so that you don't have to compromise, but figure out a way to educate people about it. And here's my point about whose onus it is. You and I, Nosey, started a business, a communication business. We've only got 50,000 Rand startup capital. And we're going to seek 5 million Rand in funding. Who has the power, us or the funder? Hmm. Well, I would assume, I mean, I, I, I feel like the one who has the money has the power, but if okay. you're the one going afterwards, what's the well, right my point is, answer? My point is this. My point is this. At the end of the day, do we have 50 people lined up to give us 5 million? And if we don't, that person has more of the power. And so my whole thing is, if you look at the cultures around the world where they dress in their traditional attire, it's cultures where they have oil power. <laughs> It's cultures where they have the economic power to be able to say to the rest of the world, I don't give a damn how you want me to dress. I've got the power. If I'm coming from a township or a rural area and I'm going to a bank and the bank doesn't want me to wear funny colored so socks, I'm not wearing the socks until I start to get the power and then I then say to you, I'm changing the culture. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, get the power and then change the culture. I'm not sure. There's certain things, and there's more nuance, and I can do a whole workshop on this. I can do a whole workshop on this. There are times when there is such negative bias where we need to radically be revolutionaries and give the middle finger to people and say, I will not compromise this part of who I am. That's my struggle. And then there are other times when you got to choose your battles. Like there's certain banks who don't like bright socks. Throw these bright socks away and get along, get with the program, kill it, and then institute a new culture when you become director where people can wear bright socks. So let me make a quick comment. I, I had to cut my dreadlocks for, for my first job. And you're right, I wanted the job badly enough that I didn't really care. But I, I, I've since been challenged when I came across a young man from KZN who had a gold tooth and had to remove the gold tooth because he wanted a job and he was given um, a piece of advice that this is not going to cut it. The thing about gold teeth is that they're not just cover. 
they actually cut your tooth in order to fit the gold tooth on. Um, and then, of course, he got the job, thankfully. Um, but a year later, it didn't actually quite work out. So there he is now with a gap in his tooth and no job at the end of it. But I hear you. I'm just being facetious. So, I, I know, I know, and I know. But I, I want to just kind of, somebody just said Mandela wore a Mandela a, shirt. A, a Madiba shirt. He's a perfect example. I've written about this a few times. Mandela had become an icon. Icons can wear whatever they want to wear. I'm not an icon yet. And sometimes I step on stage and I, did, I try to discern whether or not I have the power yet. And if I do have the power, I can show up in tackies with a hood on. If I don't have the power and I don't have the luxury to navigate that power dynamic, I get out of my emotions very fast and I show up. Recently, I was wearing a power suit with a white shirt on Zoom training at a particular law firm because I did not want to be dealing with that unconscious bias towards me because I always ask myself, if 80% of the people who look like me, how are they represented in your head? This is very controversial, but I've earned this in my career and I'm gonna say this. If 80% of the people who look like me are never on time, I cannot expect people to think I'm gonna be on time because the default in your brain is gonna be associated with the majority and this is where biases come from. If the majority of your brain has programmed in it that five plus five equals 10, you better damn well believe it's 10. And if you're gonna go around every day questioning whether or not five plus five is 10, you're gonna have a long life ahead of you. If there may be a lion out there that is a nice lion, but because I've got 99% of the lions programmed in my head that will chew my head off, I'm careful around lions because me plus a lion equals danger. And so as people of color, we have to work harder to get to a point where me plus people who look like me are on time before we expect people to think we're going to be on time. Now, when you look neurologically, if you take every person's brain that on this call, we take it out of your head, we put it on the table, and we look at all the neuronal connections, what we call the connectome. And we start mapping out what all the images that are associated with us look like. Part of the reason why I'm so happy to be living in this generation, because we are the generation changing the narrative, because we are showing up on time now. We are the ones that are innovative. We are the ones that are groundbreaking. And we are starting to change the brains of the rest of the world. We are shaking up the world as people of color. But we're not all the way there yet. We're getting there. And people are scared out of their minds. And they're scared because they haven't seen this before. They haven't seen a nosy before. They can get on stage and kill it the way you kill it. And you are changing people's brains. And every time I get on stage, I am aware that most people have never experienced a black person that knows as much as I do about the brain. So they're grappling with it. They're struggling with it. And so by the time I leave, I want you to go home and have to have a war and go, shit, I have never seen somebody who understands much as this dude understands and i want that every person on here who's a person of color to make that a challenge for yourself to go if the people who look like me have not been represented in people's minds well then i've got a war that i'm at and that's my struggle fortunately i was born free but i still have a struggle and maybe my child won't have this struggle and my grandchild definitely won't have this struggle because we are in the middle of a revolution where's my Mike, I want to drop it on your behalf and just say that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think, I think, I mean, what you've done tonight is you've not only shared um, so many insights and so many wisdoms, but I think you've ended with a provocation. Um, and I think if you're not provoked tonight as a person of color, in particular, even as a woman, um, irrespective of you know, whether you're a person of color or not, then I don't know if you're ever going to be provoked. Um, we start showing up on time, start changing the narrative by show, changing the way your posture, the way you show up and redefine it by doing, right? So I just want to say thank you. I can't believe the hour is over, but I <laughs> am so grateful uh, that we've had you. Um, I feel like it was perfect timing um, as well. I think we needed to be ready 
to hear a lot of the things that you shared with us today. And I think the biggest thing that I'm taking away is the absolute provocation. Um, and I think I love that. Uh, I think if you're not leaving this, co this conversation uncomfortable, um, then I don't know what you've been watching. But I think this was, Timothy, thank you. I think you were you. absolutely phenomenal. Good luck with Bricks. You are an incredible professional. I've been very fortunate to observe you and I appreciate your work and you are changing the narrative. You're really good at what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bricks. Thank, thank you. you, thank you guys. Bye, Cheers. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.